So hi everyone, I'm Anthony. Um, I'm going to talk to you about writing a base level library for safety critical code. Um, so as a bit of background, I'm currently working at Woven by Toyota and we make software for Toyota cars. So you know, hence safety critical code. So I'm going to do a bit of an introduction, so explain sort of background behind what we're doing. Then I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the standards involved in safety critical code, some of the tooling that we're using, um, what's involved in testing our code, uh, some of the thoughts we have on, you know, on error handling, how we approach that, and then some general sort of design impacts on how that affects the, the overall design of our code. And then you know, finish off with a, with a summary of, 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 some of some of these things. So just to start with, I mean, it, we write software for cars. And modern cars are actually big computers on wheels. Um, well, except they're not big computers on wheels. They're hundreds of small computers on wheels. Um, and we call these ECUs, electronic control units. Um, and you know, some of them do you know, incidental things, like allow you to tune a radio. And others do vital things like control the brakes. Um, and so you know, some of these, it's really, really important that they work correctly. You know, because if they don't, then you're going to find it very hard to actually drive your car and potentially cause an accident. And then lots of the code for these is written in C++. And so you know, we need to look at how do we approach safety critical code in C++. And then specifically, my team is trying to write some sort of shared code that we can use across any of the C++ code in, you know, as a base level library that you know, provides some core essential utilities and functions and data structures that can then be used across the car. So this is you know, why I'm looking at these things, why we're focused on, on, on this. So just to, to start and say, well, no. Um, there's, there's a lot of definition of talk about safety at the moment. And you know, the, you know, as Herb in his keynote said, said at the beginning of the week, then we have you know, um, safety, you know, language safety, and we have you know, memory safety, and we have software safety. And, and for what we're talking about specifically, generally we call it functional safety, or FUSA for short. Um, and we're talking about safety critical code where the software controls something that if it goes wrong, then there's a risk of injury or, or death to, to somebody. Um, possibly many somebodies, depending on quite what it is that the, the, the software is controlling. Um, so this can be you no know, quite a sort of a, you know, a, a subtly different um, use case from worrying about you know, a, a memory leak or you know, a, um, you know, a security breach where there might be long-term consequences that have, have impacts on lots of people, but they're not immediate. No, it's, it's not an immediate loss of life um, consequence. And this, this affects how, we, how you develop your software. No. And one of the things that we need to make sure that we do is we need to think carefully about the consequences of errors. No. If this piece of code goes wrong, what happens? No. How will that affect the car? Uh, in, in the big picture. Um, when we're looking at the library, then it's, well, how, much, how will that affect the code that is calling our library? What will be the, the, you know, the, the, the consequences on the larger program that's running? But overall, we're looking at, you know, we have to look at you know, how we've, how, you know, what are the consequences of errors? How do they affect things? And then having done so, we then need to look at, well, what can we do to minimize the chances of these things going wrong? Because if we can say, well, you know, if this goes wrong, then it's really, really bad, but we can make sure that it never goes wrong because we've done something else. Then that's really good. You know, we're never going to hit the line of code that has the potential for error in it, so you know, we're sorted. We don't have to worry about that bad consequence. But we need to have done the analysis and make sure that, we've, you know, that, we, that we know what we're doing, that we, we've thought of the problem and have, have addressed it. And then you need to say, well, OK, there's this bad thing that could happen. The software could go wrong in some way. What can we do to prevent that then causing a real safety incident? You know, so there's, no, it's, a, it's a, 
a large scale thing, then you, say, you know, this is a sort of you know, belt and braces approach. Is like, well, we know that this can go wrong, so what can we do? Well, you know, sometimes people you know, have you no. Know, um, no backup controllers, so you have a different piece of software that's that does the same thing, but in a slightly different way, maybe written by a different team, and you know, so that then you can say, well, if this one says you know, says do that, and that one says do the other, then we know that there's a bigger problem. But you, know, you can have you, know, you might have three and have voting. There's all sorts of you know, possible ways of, of of addressing this. But having analysed that there's a problem, you then have to think, you know, what can we do to stop that being a bigger problem, that potentially leading to act an actual safety incident. And then, of course, because this is a regulated industry, what you need is documented evidence that you've actually done all this thinking. Now, you need to write a document that's called a safety case that says, this is why we think it is safe to use our software. And, you know, that, and that contains all sorts of things together, in, uh, including, well, it's safe. You know, it starts with, it's safe because we're using a compiler that says that it, that, that's got certification to say that it's safe. Um, and then we've followed the right practices. And look, we've got evidence that we've done so. And we've tested our code. And, and, you know, and, it's, and we've thought about the consequences of errors. So you know, that's sort of where we're at. That's why, you know, why we care, what we're trying to do. And so then, obviously, in order to ensure that there's some form of standards and a way across the industry and how things do things, then there are official ISO standards that then you know, have weight in course of law. And there's two sorts of things that we might care about. Firstly, there are you know, process standards that, that specify sort of how you should run your process, you know, that say things like, you, know, you need to have testing. Um, and that you need to have done analysis, and you need to have documented that, and, and, and specify what records you need to have kept. And then, secondary to that, you then need coding standards. Now, for the, the, the process standards won't tell you what language you're going to use. You can choose any number of languages, provided that you've then got a language-specific coding standard that, that then is appropriate for the industry that says, no. Well, if I'm using C++ to do this, then I have to follow these rules. If, I'm using, if I was using Rust, then I'd have to follow those other rules. You know, if I was using C, then I'd have to follow a different set again, and making, that's, that's tailored to your language. So from a process point of view, then there is you know, a, a general sort of catch-all ISO standard, 61508, that is about any software in any electrical equipment that's relevant to safety. And that's a very sort of high level thing. Um, and though you know, if you're building electronics that's going to be safe, you will need to conform to this. But mostly, you will do so incidentally as a consequence of following an industry specific standard. So, for the automotive industry, which I work in, then ISO 26262 is the standard that we have to follow. Um, for people who are working in aerospace, then it's going to be DO178C. Um, I understand that for people working in medical, then there's a whole collection of standards, but 62304 is the sort of the umbrella. And I don't work in medical and, and haven't done so, so I, might, I don't know the details here. And I also understand that for railway software, then no, we have a, a Senelec standard 50128, which, uh, which again, I mean, I, I haven't worked in railways, but again, it's going to be the same sort of, no, they're all the same sorts of things. They tell you, no, this is the process that you must follow. This is how your system will conform to the 61508 standard as a consequence. And it will be you know, common across, across no, everyone in the same industry has to follow the same standards, which means that it's easier for people to, to, to regulate and, and check and make sure that things are you know, up, to, up to scratch. And these cover the process, you know, how you develop your software. Not about what you've written, but about the process. So they will take about... You know, how you record your requirements and making sure you know, and, and detailing your requirements. And specifically for 
but we're talking safety related stuff. So it'll be, what are the safety requirements on this piece of equipment? No. Um, if it goes wrong, what are the consequences? What, no. So no, in a car, then everything will need to conform to ISO 26262, but the, the safety requirements on the radio are probably pretty minimal, if, if, if they're there at all. Whereas the safety requirements for the steering controls or the brakes or the engine management are going to be a lot higher. And so you need to, to include, include that, and there will be you know, the standard will cover how you analyze those requirements, how you assign them to the various bits of equipment, and the software that goes in it. The standards also cover the design, how you go about designing your, your software, how you record the design of your software, the very fact that you have to record the design of your software and can't just keep it all in your head or say, well, the the, no, the source code is the design because you have to have that in a sufficient way that then can be explained to your fellow developers and the auditors. And so you then need to augment the code with additional things. Quite the details of how you do that vary depending on what the process standard is you're, trying to fo you're following uh, and which auditor you're working with and, and things like that. But you, no, you have, to, have to actually think about recording these things. And then testing. You know, it's all very well saying, yeah, you need to test your code. Well, but what does that mean? You know, the, the, the standard will tell you stuff about that. Would you have to have tested the code to cover you know, these specific, specific aspects and you know, recorded these particular things, and that um, these approaches are recommended or not recommended depending on various aspects of, of what the safety requirements are uh, and, and how stringent you're needing to be for any given thing. So that you know, it's everything about your process. Because what they don't cover is the language specific, how you implement your stuff. You know, this is the ISO 262 doesn't care about which programming language you use or how you actually write your code. What it cares about is that you have a appropriate safety critical standard for you writing C++ code if that's what you've chosen as your language. The only example that it gives is saying, if you're writing C, we know that MISRA provides an appropriate standard. Now, that's about as far as they go. <laughs> and, that's only, and that's still only an if. No. But what they do provide is a description of safety integrity levels. Now, this comes back to you know, you've got your requirements, and you're analyzing your requirements and assigning safety safety features to your, to, your, to your software. And it's like, well, how important is this safety feature? How important is it that this code runs correctly? And so you analyze the software and, you assign, and the requirements you assign a varying, varying level. And depending on which standard you're following, then the, how, the, how the levels are designated and what they mean varies a little bit. But no, the, the principle is the same. And so, no. so every, every piece of software in your, in your in your vehicle, your safe or, or medical equipment or whatever, will be assigned some safety integrity level, and you know, this will depend on quite what it's doing, what the role it plays in that in that thing is. You know, um, you know, the and 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 then what the consequences of failure are and how that relates to any. <coughs> larger scale or error mitigation things you've, you've, you've designed in. You know, but then you, you, know, you assign the, the, the safety integrity level to your piece of software, and that then determines quite how stringent you need to be about doing the analysis and testing and, and documentation of, of all the cases. So yeah, it specifies the, the, the specific rules. So for, for vehicle software, then we have five levels, and we have quality management, which is a, a sort of a, a separate thing. And it says, well, if we, if we, if you do the analysis of, of what your your software functions are, and we decide that it's sufficiently non-safety critical, then we'll just say it's, it's QM, and therefore lots of the stuff from the ISO 262 stuff says we don't care anymore. You do it your way. No, this is sufficiently not safety critical that we're not going to impose any stringent requirements on you. So 
you, you try to have as much as possible of your code fall into this bracket because it reduces the, the management overhead and your bureaucracy. You still want to make sure that you test it and do all the good engineering practices, but by putting it in the QM bracket, then it reduces the bureaucracy and the overhead of, of managing this. So you want to put as much. And also, it, it means that, well, this piece of software, if it goes wrong, it's not going to be that big a deal. It's not going to cause somebody to die. No, you've done the analysis that says so. So no, we, we can do that. So if you haven't got that, then we've then got these ASIL levels where there potentially is a danger of injury or loss of life if something goes wrong. And then the ASIL, which ASIL level it is depends on quite how serious that is. You know? ASIL A stuff is like, well, no, something will go wrong. It might lead to somebody injuring, but it's not going to be too bad. ASIL D is, if this goes wrong, then somebody's going to die. You know? And there's varying levels in between, depending on quite what the risks are and, 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 and things like that. So there's a, there's a whole you know, set of criteria in the standard that's about how you analyze these things. And so, like, well, if the consequence of this is such and such, and the risk of that actually happening is, is this, and the, you know, how, what mitigation effects have you got into board, and then you can, you know, there's decision trees and tables. So, and all the standards essentially do the same. So in the aerospace industry, then they're not called ASILs, they're called design assurance levels or item development assurance levels. It's so long since I actually worked in aerospace that I've forgotten what the difference is. Um, but essentially, they're, they're the same. We have five levels, and, they are, and no, at one end, it's, there's not a lot of problem with this, and the other one is you know, your aircraft's going to fall out of the sky if, if this goes wrong. No, so mm, it's the same, same principle. And likewise, then you know, all, the other, all the other industries will have a similar set because you know, the, the concept of safety integrity level is something that comes from the 61508 umbrella standard. And so each industry will then assign their own, own levels and their own ways of, doing the, of dividing them up and what the criteria are and things like that. So one thing that can catch you out if you move between industries is that you know, they number things differently or order things differently. Now, in automotive, then QM is we don't care, and ACLA is then we care a little bit, and ACLA, ACLD is we care a lot. In, in aerospace, then DALE is the we don't care very much, and DALA is we care ever such a lot. So you know, the, the A to A to E versus A to D is the wrong way around, depending which industry you're in. So you, if you're talking to somebody from a different industry, then it can be a little bit confusing for a second when you work out that they're talking about something that's really critical when you're talking about something that's not very, or vice versa. No. But really, if you're working in an industry, then you very quickly pick up which is the important things. So for your software, then it's easy to remember. But fundamentally, the, the, no, the higher the level, then the more stringent the analysis and testing and you know, verification um, requirements are. You know, because the consequences are worse, and so we have to try harder. And crucially, because this is you know, uh, something with power of court of law, we have to document that we've tried harder. No, so just as an example, then, you know, you, if you're ASIL A, then you can do a walkthrough of the design, talk it through with your colleagues, and, 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 and do a rev review and document that. And, and for some aspects of the design, that will be enough. If you're doing for ASIL D, then you might want to, to have a semi-formal proof um, and, and do a much more detailed inspection and analysis of the design and say, no, we are 100% no, certain that this will work. No, and that this is, we've covered all, all, the, all the corner cases, and this is what the consequences are going to be. So having moved from the process, you know, you've got a process It says you know, you've got to do some testing, you've got to actually write your code, and you've got to design, you know, done a design that meets the requirements and covers them. And then you actually, you're trying to write some code now. And so you say, well, but now we need a coding standard, because the process standard says you need a coding standard. And so that will then say you know, what language contracts you can use and how you can use them. No, because 
there's there's lots of things in a given programming language which can be confusing and lead to errors and things. If you look at the C++ core guidelines, which are nothing to do with safety critical stuff, they're just good recommended practices, but there's lots of stuff about, well, you know, if you're going to do this, then you need to pay attention to, to this aspect. And, you know, and, and this, this is the, the way that you ought to do code for it to be good code, because you know, we don't want to be bad developers. You don't over, override you know, operator plus to mean format your hard disk, because that's bad engineering practice. Um, and so you know, the safety critical coding standards then take this to the next level. You know, they then very specifically you know, detail some things. You know, they might be very, very specific. You know, one of the autos are rules is you shall not use the comma operator. This is just a blanket statement. It's not sometimes you can use it if it's good. And don't use it for bad stuff. It's just don't use it. Okay. On the other hand, they might be a bit more general. No. This one from the MISRA standard is block scope declarations shall not be visually ambiguous. So no, you, obviously the, the, the full text of the, of, the, of the rule then has a great big series of paragraphs and examples explaining quite what they mean by that. But it should, the point <laughs> is when you look at your code, it should be clear what that line does. It, and, if, if there's a potential for it to be not clear, then is there a different way that you could have structured it so that it you know, have written that line so that it really was clear? The problem with the coding standards from a practical perspective, well, one of the problems from a practical perspective is that they, it takes a while. You know, we have to introduce a new language feature, and then people have to think about, well, we have this new language feature. How can we use it safely? What are the bad consequences going to be? This takes time. You know, the the MISRA C++ standard from 2008 only covered up as far as C++03, and that itself was, you know, as a language standard, is barely anything from C++98. Uh, we then didn't really have another standard in the automotive industry until the, the AutoZAR guidelines in 2017. And these only covered C++14. So there was a whole period there where the automotive industry didn't have a standard that they could use that was more for a language more recent than C++03. So C++11 in 2016 still can't use it because we don't have a, didn't have a standard that we could work with. And no, so and as of now, in 2023, Misra published guidelines for C++17. So if you're currently in the automotive industry, this is the most recent language standard you can use unless you've got a very, very strong case that you've written some in-house standards that are good enough, which is an epic amount of work, and nobody's going to bother. So we're currently stuck with C++17. Um, and so there's a, no, this is a, no, it's an unfortunate thing, but no, you, you can't do the leading edge stuff all the time. But on the other hand, it means that there's a, you know, the, the design guidelines you know, are, have the potential to be relatively solid in what they're recommending. And, um, and even beyond the specifics of the MISRA standards and things like that, then you can know that the industry-wide standards, you know, the CPP core guidelines, for example, will have a reasonable coverage of C++ 17 language features. No, C++ 23 language features, not so much. You know, so you can, you can then feel like there's, no, there's things that you can do that you can rely on. But yeah, I mean, it's, it's a, it makes it a bit uncomfortable when you come to a conference and you say, oh, this, all, this new stuff, no, reflection in C++ 26, I'm not going to be, be able to use that until at least you know, 2030. <laughs> so <laughs> so there's, it, no, it's a little bit sad, but uh, on the other hand, yeah, no, it's, it's just the practicalities of the industry. So yeah, so no, if we're going to conform with the process standards, you have to conform with the coding guidelines, and no, that means you have to use the language versions, and you just can't use the new language versions until there is an appropriate you know, standard to go with it, unless you're willing to develop your own and convince the auditors that you've done a good enough job. So, OK. 
Okay, so what sort of tooling do we use? Well, any tooling that you, that you do use has to be suitably qualified. You know, there have, has to be, if it affects the generated code or affects the evidence that you use to demonstrate that your code is safe, then you have to have qualified the tool. But quite the details of how you do that depends on the, you know, the consequences of things going wrong or how obvious it would be to, to spot and things like that. So there's a whole you know, set of, each process standard will have a description of how you qualify tools and what you know, level they have to be done for. But that means you have to qualify your compiler, which means that then limits which vendors you can use because you have to get a vendor that's been willing to spend the time and effort to qualify their compiler. Or you have to do that in-house, which again is expensive and time consuming. If you've written any code generators in-house, you will need to get them qualified. Um, and that can be an issue, or it can just be, well, that means it's an extra six months on the project because we've got to spend the time doing this. You know, so you know, uh, it's something that you need to bear in mind. If you're using static analyzers, then again, it needs to be qualified because if, it, if you say, I'm using an analyzer to check that I conform with the MISRA standard, and it says, I will check this rule for you, and then it doesn't check the rule, then you're then relying on it to verify that you're meeting the standard, and it's doing it wrong. And so you need to have a qualified tool that says, yes, <laughs> it will actually spot. If it says that it's going to check this rule, it will actually work and, and spot where you deviate. So, you know, you, you have to qualify your analyzers. And then likewise, if you use any testing tools, um, then you might have to qualify those depending on what the consequences are and you know, how they're built. So the requirements for this qualification will depend on the safety level of the software that, that you're using it for. You know, if you're using a compiler for QM software, then you can probably just use out off-the-shelf GCC or Clang. Um, if you're using it for ACLD, then it will have to be a compiler that has been qualified for ACLD. You know, because we, we, you, know, you, you need that. And you know, that reduces the scope of vendors dramatically. Because you know, um, specifically on automotive, then ACLD is very, very high, string, high, high requirements for the qualification process. And so lots of vendors will just use ACLB uh, which is you know, sort of somewhere in the middle, and say, that's good enough, that will cover a lot of your code, so therefore, and it, and it reduces the overhead for them. And then if you want something that, that's usable in an ACE or D context, then you have to go to those vendors who are willing to put in the extra effort and then charge you more money for the, for the privilege. And then also, it's then what the consequences of the error are. No. Um, the error introduced by the tool. So, um, no, a compiler is, uh, it actually affects what the code is that goes on the car. So that's a big problem if it goes wrong. Whereas a static analyzer has less of a requirement because it doesn't affect the code, it just affects your checking of the code. And you could have done the same by doing a review. And so if you're doing, and if you're also doing code re coding reviews, which you should be, then it's then less of a, less of a requirement on the, on the analyzer. So it's less stringent than the checks on the compiler would be. And then, of course, the chances of an error going undetected you know, is, is, a, is a big thing, because you know, if, the, if the tool gets it wrong, but you know, it's, it's really obvious within, within moments that you know, by, by just having a glance at the report that it's got it wrong, then that's much less of an issue than some, it gets it wrong and then nobody notices until the car crashes. So it's about you know, how, big is, how big is the consequences, how subtle is the, is the error such that people wouldn't not, may or may not notice. So I know I've mentioned static analyzers a couple of times, and, you know, and the MISO coding standards. 
the, the industry coding standards are going to be large. They will have a heck of a lot of rules. If you had to analyze you know, the millions of lines of code that go in a car, line by line, individually, manually, to check whether they conform with the coding standards, that's going to take forever. So we don't want to do that. And lots of the rules in the coding standards have been written such that analyzers can check. And so then you buy an analyzer that is qualified to check the rules. Because, yeah, in, in, enforcing by code review is tedious and error prone. You do it anyway, as much as you can. When you review your code, before merging it, you say, does it conform to the coding standard? But you're not going to remember all the rules, because there are too many of them. So you'll, no, you'll look at it and think it, and you'll spot the obvious things, and the things which you know that the tool can't check, but no, you still want the tool to check most of them. No, it, tool, the, the tools are essential to, to actually you know, being able to do this in any sensible length of time. So you know, we run the, the static analysis as part of our um, CI system. Uh, you, if you create a, um, a merge request, then, or any t in fact, any time you check in some code, then it will run the static analyzers on your, on your code. And you cannot merge it to main if the static analyzers don't pass. It's, it's that simple. It's, it's, it's just a gate. And you can also run them locally. Um, and you probably want to because you know, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a pain to push code to review, get your colleagues to approve it, and then you know, say, oh, but you can't merge it anyway because the static analyzer says no. You know, it's like, well, you could have run that locally and checked. No, and so, no, so we do, and it, it's yeah, and it 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 can take a while. Uh, some of the analyzers do sort of you know, whole program analysis, and so um, they they will then you know, have to compile your entire program, and then they will sit there and analyze the whole program against the whole list of rules, and that can take a while. Um, others of them do each source file individually because they're checking much you know, more local specified rules. And those can be much much quicker, but they still take time. It still all takes time. But so you know you. No. <laughs> but yeah, you you don't want any, you don't want it to merge to to the main release branch unless it passes the rules. You ideally don't want to push anything for other people to look at if you if it if it doesn't pass the rules because then you're wasting their time because they're going to look at code you're going to change in a minute. No, so. No. You, you, it's, it's worth running it, lo running it locally when you're reasonably happy. You, know, you wouldn't want to do it every commit because it takes a while. You know, I, I, I run my tests every commit because they, they run fast enough. But the static analyzers are an order of magnitude slower, so I just can't do that. You know. But then uh, the, the result of the static analyst analysis in the CI system is then recorded and that forms part of our safety case. Now, the, the evidence that our code conforms with the MISRA standard is that our static analyzer ran, and this is its report. And yeah, just as a, as a, as a general sort of principle, uh, <laughs> then if you have required checks, Automate them because then you won't forget to do them, and it makes having the evidence gathering just so much easier. Uh, and I'm, to be quite honest, that applies everywhere. If, if there's something that you have to do, and you can, then rather than relying on, you know, some you're trying to make a release of of any piece of software, then okay, well I've got to do this. I've got to package the package the documentation. I've got to do the other. And, no, if there's if there's multiple things in a list that you've got to do, you're going to forget one of them. And so if you can make a, make a script that does it, then it's just so much easier. Um, and, but in our case, it becomes essential because we need things to have happened um, you know, for, for our safety case evidence. So what about testing? You know? We want to actually test our code. We're not just going to look at it. Quick, quick cast eye over our code, five minutes, say, ah, looks good to me. Ship it, all done. It's like, well, no, that's not going to cut it. We actually need to, to verify that it does do the right thing. 
and you know, and and do that in a way that um, has evidence. So we need to verify it does what it's what it's actually intended to do. Um, and yeah, I mean that means testing. You could do it. No, the standards do allow you to do lots of the verification by formal proof. Um, most people's software is not amenable to formal proof. No, but some people no, in no, some people manage. There are some so some subsets where um, rather than writing code in C++, then you write it in a you know, some form of modeling language which has a formal proof engine, and then you can do the formal proof instead of doing the testing. But you have to have something that that actually can do that. And if you're writing C++, we just don't have that available. And so testing is what we're at. And of course, we mean automated testing so that you can rerun the tests and find out you know, and say, look, you know, this is the software we're shipping. I run the tests. Here, look, let me show you. Oh, look, they all pass. You know, rather than, yeah, well, I did run the tests. or you know, And it says, click here, click there, click the other, do this. And uh, I did do that, honest, and I signed my name at the bottom to say so. But you know, where, where's the evidence that you actually did follow that test script if you do it manually? So whereas if you make it automated, then it's repeatable on demand if necessary. One thing that people talk about a lot when they're talking about testing is coverage. No. I went to a talk earlier in the week. Somebody was talking about coverage of um, templated tests. Ideally, for safety critical code, you want 100% coverage. And that... So, and the, which means, in principle, that every piece of code that goes on your car has been exercised by at least one test. If it hasn't been exercised in the test at all, then you have to question, why is it on the car? What on earth is it doing? And so that's where we're aiming for. You know, we want to have 100% coverage. Of course, the fact that there is a test somewhere that exercises this piece of code doesn't necessarily mean that the code does what it's supposed to, because that requires that you've actually written your test correctly. You, know? you, can, you, can, you can write a test that calls a piece of function, uh, uh, calls a function, and then ignores the result, and then asserts on something else. You know? and, and that would count for coverage, but doesn't actually help you in check whether your software does anything. But you know, let's just look at what coverage means. And so there's a few types of coverage that one cares about. <laughs> The most obvious is line coverage or statement coverage, and that is that every line of your production source code is covered by a test. So there's some test that runs that line of code. Is the base thing, you know. And so, you know, yeah, like I say, if there's a line of code that isn't run by a test, why? You have to think. You know? and, that, and so that, and, and that's the, the key mindset to have when looking at coverage is that it, it gives you a way of telling you things that you've missed in your tests. It's not a 100% coverage is we're done, our tests are marvelous. It, no, it's a 50% no, coverage is there's a heck of a lot of stuff we haven't tested. Why is that? No, even if you get to 99%, then it's still, what happened in the other 1%? Why isn't it tested? Sometimes that is a real, there's a real practical reason. You can't test that because, no, it's a, it's a, it's a belt and braces check for you know, something really bad happening, like uh, um, like if a, no, an, if a if the result of a function that's supposed to return only three values, and you test that function and it returns only three values, then you can say, well, just as a belt and braces check, if it returns what, something that's not one of those three, then I'm going to terminate my application. And you, there's no way that you can check that without substituting in a a, 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 a fake function that actually returns a bad value. Uh, because it, sh it shouldn't happen, but, you're, but you put some code in there anyway. We have a question. Uh, is there any mutation testing involved? So the, the question, mutation testing, is that yeah. what you're asking? Yeah. Uh, no, well, we currently don't do mutation testing. We do fuzz testing, but not mutation testing. Um, it is something that we've talked about and considered a few times, but we haven't got a tool that we can use easily off the shelf at the moment, and so it keeps getting punted. <laughs> okay. No. But yes, it is, it is something to consider. Thank you. Yeah. 
Okay, so yeah, so just you know, here is some code. We have a function foo. Uh, it takes two, two unsigned integers. Um, if a is less than b, it returns zero. Otherwise, it returns the sum of them. Um, and so if we call it with one and two, then we get zero. We have, an, have a test that asserts that. And then, of course, that, no, that second line is then not covered. The, the function is covered. It's called by the test, but the second line is not covered. Uh, so that would then say, it's not covered. We should have a test for that. And then you write another test and, no, and, and verify that it now does something meaningful in that case. But yeah, line, line coverage can be tricky. I mean, here's the case I was just mentioning. No, we have a function, get color. It returns an enum. You can test that class and verify that it only returns one of the two values of the enum. But an enum is a wrapper around an int, really. And so it might, and it might be an int of only eight bits, but it's still an int that therefore has potential for more than the two values that are listed. And so we're actually going to need a default case. And this is a requirement from the coding standard that you, would, you, know, you need to have cover, cover all the possible options within the cut if you use a switch case. And that means there must, there must be a default. But if get color only returns red or green, which it really ought to, and you will have tests that demonstrate that, you're never going to hit that error case. No, that, that case, it might just be impossible to reach. So, so in, no, yeah, in, the, in these cases where it is impossible to reach, you would then need to document alongside your test output to say, yes, we're only at 99.9%, .9%, but that's because these three lines are not reachable. And this is why. No, you don't have to have 100%, but you have to know why you haven't. And you have to document it so the auditors can check. Next thing you might look at is branch coverage. And then, so this is where any time there's a condition, then both the true and false branches are evaluated and, you know, and then see something and, and actually have, a, have an effect. Uh, and that can be, like, and in this particular case, we have our function bar that it has an if. And it doesn't have, the if doesn't have an else. But you still want to check whether the, both the true and false branches of that con conditional. No, the fact that there's an else branch, with, that, with only one test, you can't test that. No, you can't get 100% branch coverage because no, it either checks the, the true branch or the false branch, but not, by, not both in one test. And if you've got an explicit else branch, then that will get picked up by the line coverage because you'll have to have test the, the line, the, the code that runs in the, in, the, in the true branch and the code that runs in the else branch will have to be evaluated, otherwise your line coverage won't get there. But when you've got missing else's, then the branch coverage will say, hang on a minute, you still didn't check that case. No, and and it, the, the simple reason is, if you can't reach the alternative option, then that conditional shouldn't be there. Your code should be simpler. And if, no, and, 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 no, and so it makes you look at your code and think, you no, know, is there a reason why that I have this branch? Why do I have this conditional? You know, can I make the code simpler and remove it? Or do I need to add a test to verify that it actually triggers in the right cases? You know, so you know, it makes you think about your code. <coughs> and again, no, 100% might not be achievable. Um, and if, in which case, then you need to think, well, why? And, and if there's a real concrete reason, then you need to document it. The third and most tricky form of the coverage checks is modified condition decision coverage, MCDC. And this is about, no, you have an if which has multiple parts. No, if this and that or the other, no, then we'll do whatever. No. And it's about making sure that your condition is, well, as simple as possible, and that you've actually thought through all the cases and that they're, you know, that they're needed. So uh, here, here is some case. We have you no know, an if. We have condition A and condition B or C. Uh, and if, if those are true, then we'll call some function foo. And if the overall thing gives us false, then we'll call bar instead. 
So branch coverage would just have us, well, have we got something where the whole expression evaluates to true or the whole expression evaluates to false? And yeah, that's fine. We need to cover those cases. But then, well, no, we've got this and B or C part in the middle. No. What if B is never true? And we're, and we're only ever caring about whether or not C is true. No. Why have we got that in there? Why does it matter? Uh, what if it's supposed to have an effect and actually it doesn't? No. No. These are things that one needs to think about. No. So it's like, well, what are the possible options? And you can draw a table. And, then, and with three cases, this gives you eight, eight rows. Um, if you've got a more complex thing, then it very quickly gets to lots and lots and lots of rows. Um, so in principle, if you're aiming for full condition coverage, then you want to cover every line in that table. And that gets you know, unwieldy, because you've got to cover all eight cases for this one, but then all eight cases for, you know, if you've got this in multiple places, then you end up with lots, of, lots and lots and lots of conditions to check. And that means lots and lots of testing. You can do it, but it's, it's messy. And, you know, and it doesn't necessarily gain you anything being exhaustive. So instead, we have this concept of modified conditional decision coverage. Um, because the full case is exponential in the number of, number of conditions, um, we do something different. We limited the choices. And we say, for each of the conditions in our you know, overall test, overall check that we're doing, then we must have a test that exercises this, the overall condition such that that part has a different value, and consequently, the overall result has a different value, you know, with both, both ways around. And that must be, you know, so there must, for each thing, then there must be a, a, a example where that is the only difference between two, two test invocations is that that one has triggered and it has changed the overall effect. So we can now reduce our case to four cases. Because if we start with you know, A is false and B is true and C is false, then the result is going to be false. Because, well, because A is false. You know, we've got an and on there. So if we start with that as our base thing, and then all we do is we change the result of A. So whatever the test is that, that, that A is, you know, is, is you know, some variable is less than another, some variable is bigger than another, some function returns true, whatever. You know, we do something that ch changes the result of A in our test, we, in the test setup. And so now we have true, true, false, and the result is now true. But we've only changed one thing. We changed A. And then based on that line, if we now do something that changes B, then we get true, false, false, and the result is now false. So we've changed B only, and the result has changed. So again, this is, you know, meets the criteria, and, but we've only changed one thing. And then finally, for the third condition, Based on that one, we can change C only. And again, that triggers the result from false to true. And so again, we've, got, we've met the condition. And so now we're down to four things. And if you, I know, so that, in this case, that's half the number of cases that we need to test, which is good. Um, and no, if the expression was more complex, that would have had a greater reduction. So no, it's something to, to look at. Um, it's still hard to measure. Uh, so you know, we have a um, version of Clang 17 that does, you know, does this, this measurement for, you know, of the you know, modified condition decision coverage, and there are other tools that do it as well. Um, but otherwise, then you, you, you could do with doing it yourself, particularly as you look, as you look at the higher ACL levels, then, um, then it becomes important. Of course, one thing you could always do is you could just split that if, and you could say, if A, do this or else do the other. And then within that first branch, you could say, if B, do that, else do whatever. And if C, do this or else do whatever. And then you can, can ex break it up into lots of, lots of small parts so you don't have to, have to do the modified con um, condition decision. And you can just then rely on the simple branch um, and, and line coverage to, to cut, make sure you've covered all the cases. But depending on the expression, it might be easier to review the code when it's a single expression. And so you know, you've, you've got, got to, you know, to weigh up where the important things are.
So yeah, if you do manage to achieve 100% of your modified condition decision coverage, you can see that it ensures that every element in that, in that lengthy condition is actually important. You know, it is there, and it's there for a reason. Because if you can't manage to do that, then it's like, well, either there's a problem in the overall system such that B is never true, or you really don't want it there, and you just got you know, if is just if A and C. And then you've got simpler code to review and, uh, and, and makes your life overall that, that little bit better. You know, so attempting to achieve 100% helps you analyze your code and see whether, they, whether it can be simplified or whether you've got a, a bigger error somewhere. And then the final thing, of course, is requirements coverage. You know, the ISO 26262 standard says the implemented software unit shall be verified, blah, 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 to provide evidence for confidence in the absence of unintended functionality. You know, your Software doesn't do anything you didn't intend it to, is what it says. And you need to be confident of that and have evidence of that. And that means that your tests have to be linked back to your requirements. So that, you no, know, it's all very well. You have a test I call function foo. It returns 42 if I give it numbers one and two. Marvelous. How does that impact what the software, the car is supposed to do? I don't know, unless you've got something in there that there's a requirement on the, heart, on the car that says, no, under these conditions, we must do it. Our design says we've split it up into these functions. No, as a consequence, then we have this function foo. It must return 42 when we call it with these parameters because, and so you can trace that back to the requirements you know, through, through whatever levels of design that you, you've split things out into. So yeah, if you're going to have confidence that it doesn't do anything unintended, you jolly well ought to know what it is intended to do. You know? And yeah, you, and so you, got, you look at your tests and you look at your requirements and you, you know, link them up. Um, and there's varying ways you can do that depending on what tooling you've got. You know, that might be source code annotations that link, that contain an ID number in the test that then links to a requirement number that's in your requirements tool, or it might be something far more integrated than that in, the, in your requirements tool than you've actually, you know, um, the tool actually, then you write the tool in a special language in the requirements tool that then you know, uses something like you know, um, Gherkin or Cucumber or you know, one of these behavior-driven tools to actually then invoke your code directly from the requirements tool. You know, there's, there's lots of ways you can do these things. Um, and we have a, a mix, depend, you know, depending on, on the specifics. But you need to have some sort of you know, review of what your, what your code is supposed to do versus what your tests say that it does. You know, and, and then with the 100% require coverage, then that says, well, the, it only does then what the tests have covered. And so there's a whole, you know, it, all, it all goes together to make sure that you're not doing anything you did, shouldn't be. The, car, the software does what it's supposed to, and only that. Yeah, man. it's all very well having 100% coverage, but if it doesn't do what you want, then that's no good. Man. And as part of that review, then what you also need to think about is all the corner cases. You know, the, you know, it's all very well saying you know, that the no, the, the, the speedometer should show the current, case, current speed of the car, but no, how is that measured? What does it happen? No, uh, does the speedometer only show you the speed when you're going forwards? What about if you're in reverse? No, just simple things like that. I, I, I've certainly been in cars where in reverse the speedometer shows zero. No? Um, and that's not necessarily very helpful if, you're, if you can actually manage to get up to a significant speed in reverse, which lots of modern cars can. You know? So uh, you need, need to think through all the, all, the, all the corner cases and make sure that, you know, that they're, they're actually properly tested. And then just as a, as a practical matter, then this means you end up with a lot of test code. No, I, I, I did a quick scan over, um, over no, the, the portion of, the, of our software that I, that I actively work on. And for every non-comment, non-white space line of 
production code, there is somewhere between four and five lines of non-white space, non-comment test code. So the vast majority of our code base is tests. And, uh, and this just you know, covers over, you know, continues to the other teams as well. But I haven't, I haven't done, the, done the analysis for quite what the numbers are for their code. Uh, and if you think about it, then this makes sense. Because when you write a test, you're, writing, you're testing something specific, whereas your code is, covers the general case. Um, and so you, you, know, you test, OK, what happens if I give it this input? Well, well, what about that other input? And so then you need to test it with the other input too, but the, your, your code under test hasn't changed. And sometimes then you can reduce your test code by using tables. So you have a table of, well, this is all the expected input, and this is the corresponding output. And so it simplifies the tests, but you still need you know, the, the, the table probably still counts as test code. You know, so you know, it all adds up. You, know, you might well parameterize it to reduce duplication. I mean, um, template tests are a particular pain. Testing templated classes is like, well, in principle, every separate instantiation is its own class and therefore probably needs its own tests. In practice, then you know, some, some parts of your task template will depend on properties of the, of the types that you give it. And there will be something that there is like, this, this member function doesn't exist for this template parameter. Or you know, this member function has a, you know, essentially has two branches inside you know, with the equivalent of if const expra. It, you know, um, which depends on the properties of the template parameters. And so you can't cover all, the whole function you know, in all template instantiations because they, you know, it just doesn't work like that. You know, or you've, you've given um, specific, instantiated with specific things that always throw when you try and copy them in order to check that if you copy something that's throwing, then it does the right thing. But that means when you instantiate it with that, then the code that, you know, that if it ever tries to copy that object, then it will throw and it will never carry on into the rest of the function. And so you know, this then becomes something you have to then you know, document and say, well, I haven't achieved 100% coverage because you know, we've got you know, these specific sets of inputs. So yeah, we end up with a heck of a lot of test code. Yeah, question. Yeah. Can you use assertions? <laughs> okay, the, the question was, can we use assertions? And yes, and we do. Um, and yeah, we'll, I'll talk about assertions in a minute. So yeah, so uh, when you're error handling, well, you need to think fundamentally, and this is an important thing to think throughout the whole of your software, is what if something goes wrong? No, our software is safety critical. Fundamentally, if the whole thing goes wrong, somebody could die. So on this little bit, then we just need to bear that in mind. It's like, well, what if something goes wrong here? No, what are the potential consequences right here? And there's fundamentally three things that we need to handle. One is that somebody called our function and gave it invalid input, and that might be um, Invalid input from um, a user. No, somebody actually typed something in that was that was wrong. No, um, it might be invalid input because a hardware sensor has gone wrong, and so the output from the hardware sensor is now just completely bonkers, and, 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 and it doesn't make sense anymore. No, it's supposed to be measuring. Um, you know, how many rotations per second your wheel is doing so you can calculate the speed. It tells you you're doing 2 billion rotations per second. If your car wheels are doing 2 billion rotations per second, then something magical has happened with your engineering. Because, no, I can't imagine that happening. Um, in which case, probably the sensor is wrong. It's probably what's happened there. Um, but still, it, the point is that the software doing the calculation, it receives this number, number of rotations per second, 2 billion. OK, well, it's invalid input. Um, which sometimes is a consequence of undesigned, beh desired be undesired behavior of other systems, but sometimes it, no, the undesired behavior is where you've asked the system to do something, and then it's gone wrong. No? You say, 
open a file, and the file system says, this corrupt. No, so I can't give you that file. No, OK, well, how do I handle that case? No, you've then got to think about that. And then the final case is logic errors. And this is where it's all your fault. No, when you were writing this code, you got something wrong. Or, no, or whoever was designing the, this particular part of the infrastructure designed it wrong. No, there's something no, wrong here. Um, and so obviously, no, but you need to handle this all the same. No, there, there's something that's gone wrong. And, and yeah, fundamentally, if you write your code such that you are getting input from somewhere and you fail to anticipate the thought that it could have gone wrong, or you're asking another piece of software to do some, another part of the system to do something, and you don't anticipate that that could go wrong, then that in itself is a logic error. No, you, no, it, it all comes down to you as the developer are responsible for making sure that this works. And if, you, if, you, if your thinking is, doesn't cover all the cases, then no, that's a, I, I'm going to call that a logic error, and, 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 and there we are. No, <laughs> that's just no, the, the, the catch-all for, for what, what we have. So yeah, so any input you get from somewhere else, it could be invalid. That could be an accident. No, there, there's some, no, somebody mistyped something, um, it misread something, or, no, or no, the, the, the number, there was, uh, no, a bit flip due to cosmic rays, you know, but the, the, it could be entirely invalid, accidental. You know, nobody was intending it to be wrong. But it could be corruption, it could be, um, you know, or, or it could be malicious, or it could be a hardware fault. You know, there's lots of reasons why you might get in, invalid input, but you need to deal with, deal with the potential that there's invalid input. And then, of course, you know, one thing which is you know, also likely is that you're getting input from external systems, or the overall system is somehow operating outside its design constraints. No, you're, um, you've got a, no, a car designed for running in the city. No, maximum temperature you know, in, in most cities is not going to exceed 50 degrees Celsius. If you take that car to the desert um, and suddenly it's no, 85, then your car might not work. The hardware might actually behave differently. Um, and so things are operating outside the design constraints. Things will then you know, give you incorrect values, and you have to deal with the potential of those incorrect values. Because, uh, so therefore, you, know, you have to incorporate you know, this into the design. You have to validate your input. Um, probably have to log validation errors. You know. No, do report no, report errors in case there's a, no, in case this, this is something that's going to um, happen again. So that, no, you something goes wrong. You take your car to the garage. You can say something went wrong, and they can look at the logs and say, oh yes, no, <laughs> this has gone wrong because such and such a sensor was giving you duff values. No, um, it might be important to use default values. It's like well, okay, the the the, the wheel sensor tells me I'm doing two billion revs per minute. Well, that's clearly not true. What do I do? No, you've got to make a decision there. And it might be, well, you say, well, OK, I'm going to guess that that means we're going fast, or guess that we're stopped, or something, and use the default value. Or you might just say, I don't know what to do with that altogether. Um, no, I'm going to no, just, just give up on doing this calculation and, and stick an error on the dashboard and say, speed unknown. No, you've got to make, it, make a decision on what, no, no, what, what, what you're going to do with that invalid input. And then similarly, you, know, you try and you ask another system in the car to do something, and it might not do it. And you need to cope with that. Uh, that might be a transient problem due to you know, external conditions. There's a wire that's you know, got a bit frayed, and it, it jiggled out, and so the, the connection didn't work. But then if you do it a second later, then the connection will now work, and it's all fine. Or just you know, it might be something simple, uh, something that happens. You know, the, you know, you're, you're trying to tune the radio when you drive through a tunnel and so the radio, radio doesn't work because there's no signal. No. Or, the, or the sat-nav doesn't work because there's no satellite signals or something. But then you, know, you come out of the tunnel and the sat-nav now picks up the signal, satellite signals and it's all good again. There might actually be a fault in the other system. No. 
the you're tr you're trying to use the sat nav to get things, and then the 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 the, the radio antenna is actually broken, you know, and they can't can't get up the, the satellite signals regardless. No. Or again, no, th this it might not work because we're outside the design constraints in some way. No, you, you, you've, no, you've just driven your car into, in, into, uh, into a big puddle and you thought it was only three inches deep and it turns out to be three feet deep and now your car's underwater and half the engine doesn't work. Um, so uh, th things, no, there's lots of reasons why things might not work and you need to make sure that your software takes account of that. Even if it is just to say, I tried to make that other system do something and it couldn't do it, so now I can't do what I'm supposed to do. Panic. No. It, it, actually have that thought and design, decide that sometimes, sometimes no, panicking can be okay. No, the, it can be something that you design into your system. And then of course, yeah, you can, might have some corruption. corruption. It might be no, uh, the, 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 the cosmic, cosmic rays or you know, magnetic fields or aging hardware, meaning that the disk is corrupt or, so, or whatever. No. But you might have to, have to incorporate that in your design. Um, and, and at the very least, that means you've actually got to check any error codes. If you, if you call something then it's, and it gives you an error, do something with that error. Don't just ignore it. <laughs> so so the, 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 the MISRA coding standards will say you can't ignore error codes. And, Rightly so, because you want to make sure that things happen. Um, and also, you might want to verify that things happen by doing an ex a different check. Uh, there's a, a classic story about you know, problems with with a nuclear power plant, and you know, something it was like it's overheating, and so they you know, they press the coolant button, and the coolant light comes on, and says it's all cooling down, it's all fine. But, what the, but all that the all that the indicator does is check that somebody's pressed the coolant button. It doesn't actually check that the door is open to let the coolant through, and so, no. and so the so the no, the um, power station keeps overheating, and people don't know what's happened until there's a big problem. But yeah, so you ne you need to actually sometimes if it really really matters that you've, that this works or not, verify. You no, know, by an independent path, and then you no know, propagate errors if if you need to. So. One common design thing that happens in safety critical stuff is um, a concept of a watchdog. Because most of the time, safety critical systems need to keep running. No? And no, if you're driving down the motorway and the car software just gives up and says, no, nope, I can't do anything, then your car is probably going to just grind to a halt in the middle of the motorway and there'll be a big, big accident and, everybody, no, and, and big problems. So you want the system to overall keep running. Even if it says, please stop now, quick, no, there's a big problem, and it flashes on the dashboard, and, no, and, then, and then you, no, you pull off. If you can get to the, the hard shoulder and slow, and slow down and, and, and stop and get out of the car, then you can uh, alleviate a problem. But overall, the system needs to keep running in order to, get, to help you make that safe, um, safe transition. No, likewise, if somebody's got a pacemaker in there, no, keep their heart going. It's no good for the, the software, the, the, whole, the pacemaker as a whole, to say, no, I can't work today. I give up. No, it, the, the system has to keep going. And so there's often no, a watchdog of some description that says, well, something went wrong somewhere in here. Um, so I'm just going to reset the system to a known good state and try again. And lots of the time, no, this is sufficient to allow you to keep the system going. It won't necessarily do what you were hoping it to do in the long term, or no. no so, so no, no. Your car is driving, and now the no, the car. Well, no, only goes slow. You can't accelerate. You can't use the cruise control. The radio doesn't work. But at least you can pull off slowly to the hard shoulder, no, because the the system keeps going. And so, no, something goes wrong in the middle. No, the it resets rather than rather than continuing in an, in an un, unidentified state. Um, so just as, there was an example um, many years ago now where there was a Toyota car and the accelerator pedal got stuck. And so you know, the, um, it would just keep accelerating and there was nothing that the driver could then do about that. And that, that caused some accidents. And so Toyota had a big, you know, 
make a big fuss about this fact because they don't want that to happen. And the point, but if the system internally you know, detect, had, could detect that something was going wrong and just say, I'm going wrong, so restart and reset, then that you know, avoids you from doing an unexpected, undesired behavior. So you know, it would say, well, something's going wrong here. The, the, you know, the accelerators keep going even though I'm now in you know, 150 miles an hour or whatever. Um, no, um, no, and things. So you, if you, this comes back to, you, know, you put some asserts in your code. You know, we had the question earlier, can you use asserts? You say, well, something's gone wrong here. I'm going to assert that something's gone wrong rather than continuing in this bad state. And then that will then trigger the watchdog. And the watchdog will reset you and say, go to this known safe state and carry on. And hopefully the system as a whole will keep going in order to, you know, to, to get where we're going, even though we, we might have some warning lights up now. Because, yeah, it's often safer to reset the system than continue when you've, inca when you, when you've detected that a logic error has happened. Because if you have a logic error, then by definition, it means that the system is now in a state that you weren't expecting. And if the system is now in a state that you weren't expecting, you don't know what the consequences of doing things are going to be. And so, you know, particularly, you know, um, if you're, if you, you know, from a C++ perspective, if continuing might lead to undefined behavior, you don't know what that's going to do on, the, on your car. And so it is, it, it is better to say, continuing will lead to undefined behavior. I won't continue. I give up. Please reset me. Than it is to continue with that unexpected, unknown behavior consequences. But... Still, logic errors are bad, so we don't want to have we don't want to have the case where we detect them at runtime. So we, you know, review code, we do the testing to try and make sure that they're not there. But if we do encounter one at runtime, then we terminate the program, reset the controller, reboot whatever, whatever the, the watchdog is programmed to do, and that you know, that might well be a, it might be a software watchdog, you know, at the lowest level that has reset if that process dies, restart it. Um, no, <laughs> basic level, if you've got something like system D that then just watches, you know, if your web server goes down, it restarts it. No, there might be something as simple as that, and then you know, put it in the, you know, as appropriate to, to, to in-car software. Or it might be that it's actually a hardware, hardware thing that says, well, if you don't tell me you're still running safely, then I will reset the whole chip. Um, and you know, lots of embedded software does that. So this relates down to, you know, to preconditions, something that must be true if I'm going to run, call this function. And it therefore is a logic error to invoke that function if the precondition is not true. And so uh, as an aside, if the caller could not check that and could not know that it was the case, then it shouldn't be a precondition. It's something you should be checking in the function itself and returning an error if the caller couldn't have, couldn't have checked already. And this comes down to failure to validate your external inputs is a logic error. No. But that means that then our code is, is, is full of code, of code like this. We have, some, have a precondition macro that terminates if the condition is not true on the, on the assumption that then the watchdog will catch this termination and reset the appropriate parts of the system, acknowledging that something went wrong. No. We've got some function. It's going to frob negate the widget. And it but only was if you give it a valid index of a widget. And so you, know, you have to check that it's within, within the range. And so whatever it is that you're doing, you know, we, put, we have these preconditions everywhere. You know, because you know, it, it documents what it is that we're expecting. And then at runtime, it will check. And I have a question over here. Hi there. You, you mentioned the watchdog is going to do the job of terminating that when the preconditions met. Well, I'm saying the, the watchdog will do the job of restarting the system. Or the restarting, parts of the right, system. but the precondition just kills it. Yeah. Synchronously at that point. Okay, thanks. And that's, you know, fundamentally, you're never going to intend to call a function outside its, you know, with its preconditions it violated. And so, but so, because you didn't intend it, something's gone wrong and we don't know what. And so, therefore, the system is in a state we don't know about, and 
and therefore there are unknown consequences for, con for continuing. So we try to minimize harm and reset to a, to a safe state in hope that the overall system can keep going. The car can keep driving, maybe with the warning lights. So how does this impact what the, the overall design of our code? You want to think about eliminating and mitigating as many possible sources of error. You know, and just in general, I mean, it's, that's always a good idea, but it's something that we really have to, to keep, it, keep at the forefront of our minds as we do this. And consequently, we want to favor compilation errors over runtime errors. You know? If it doesn't build, it won't end up on the car going wrong. You know? If it's a runtime error, then that can happen at runtime in the car. So maybe, you know, it, better if it doesn't, better if it causes a compilation failure. You know? We want to make things co correct by construction. And so there's you know, lots of things you, you know, use Sfine and templated constraints to, to ensure that you, know, you can only call the function a, a function template or instantiate a class template when the con constraints are met. Uh, so we get com compilation errors. Uh, restrict the co construction of things so you can only construct them with correct values, and if they don't construct with correct values, then you have an error of some description that again gets reported. You know, Crank up your errors. You know? Use the maximum error warning on your compiler. Um, and make error no, maximum warning level on your compiler and make those warnings errors. So that you know, the, comp the reason that the warnings are there is because the compiler vendors know that sometimes this is bad code or code that has potential for problems. It's usually straightforward to rewrite the code such that it doesn't trigger the warning. And in having the thought necessary to do that rewrite, you might identify that there really was a problem or whether actually, no, this was OK, and I can just you know, add the appropriate cast rather than relying on the implicit one or something like that. Because these are no, they're the first line of defense against accidental errors. Uh, and as a, as a side effect, if you do the, the work to eliminate the warnings, then it will probably make your code clearer for people who are reviewing it. Now, your colleagues who are, who are you know, reviewing your code before you merge it to main will thank you when your code is simpler, and, or clearer at the very least. And it might be that the person who was, wants to know how clear it is is you in a month's time when you're trying to fix some problem or make a change. The second thing is we use no discard everywhere. Um, no, ignoring error codes is just inherently bad. Lots of the time, then um, and there's, you don't want to discard the, the values for all so, return values for all sorts of reasons. The, the coding standards say you shouldn't ignore things. If you use no discard, it's a compile error. No, it's, it, say it brings, brings the problem forward. Rather than the review check, it's a compile error. No, obviously, yeah, I mean, if you've got RAI return values, you use something like make unique, and it gives you a thing, and then you discard the return value, and it destroys your thing straight away. And it's like, uh, sometimes then that leads to obvious problems, and sometimes less obvious ones. Right? Um, from a, a, a common mistake that people do with std async is that they forget to capture the return value in a future, and so then it then doesn't actually make it asynchronous. It runs it on another thread, but it waits for it before it carries on in the, in the current function. And, uh, and so you know, you, if, if you use no discard, then that avoids that sort of problem. And then obviously, if it's a raw resource, then it might lead to a leak if you don't actually capture it so that you can clear it up later. Use strong types, you know, because you know, create abstractions for everything. Don't use just raw integers, unless you really, really do mean just three. You know? But, but still, it, well, three what? No, what is it that, it, no, that it's a thing? No, don't use pointers because uh, it's not clear how many elements there are at that pointer. Is it just one object? Or is it three or 100? Well, use span, and then you don't have to worry because span tells you it's got a bounds check. Use a quantity template. Um, like in Matthias's talk, no, 
to ensure you can't pass values which have got the wrong units. I mean, it, I mean, we've seen sort of stories about you no know, space rockets. The, 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 the space rocket dies because there was you no know, one measure was in miles per hour and the other one's in kilometers an hour or something like that. And then and, and, and the different unit things and uh, you no know, or people refuel, refueling a an aircraft with pounds of fuel when it was supposed to be kilograms of fuel, and so it runs out of fuel midair. Now, if, if, if you actually like, have, do any unit conversions within your code or different parts of the code where they have the same quantity in different units, you want to make sure that the units are encoded so that at compile time you can tell if, the, if things are you know, being passed around to somewhere which is a different unit expectation. Same for IDs. No? If you've got... Uh, uh, if you're looking up objects by some form of ID, then have a unique type for each ID. Now, this is the ID of a foo object as opposed to the ID of a bar object, rather than just saying, oh, well, it's a 64-bit integer, and I can just pass them around. OK, well, no, can, can you confuse them? Have you got, ever got a function that operates on both? No, or, or two similarly named functions that operate on different ones, and both are available in the same function. And so you know, create strong types to hold those IDs instead. And then, of course, use RAII. No, that is just the, no. it's classic good software engineering in C++. It becomes more critical when your, the, the, the consequences of your software going wrong is more critical. No, it allows us to take ownership and um, ensure that we know the lifetime of, you know, of, of objects and, and things like that and, and resources. No, we ensure that the destructors always happen. And this can be crucial no, if you're putting lots of error condition, error checks in, and so you have breaks and continues and maybe some throws in the middle of your function, you still want to make sure that your resources are cleaned up. And, you do, and the destructor will do that for you. Whereas if you don't use RAII, you have to do it manually. So yeah, if, we, if we just have, no, call some acquire resource function, and we try and do stuff and it returns, that's fine. Then we can release our resource. But actually, you know, if that was some form of error check, you know, you know, then, and it returns false, then our, we return a different result, but now we skip the error check, the, the, you know, uh, skip the release. You know, so we, you know, use, using RAII just makes our code simpler. So if anyone needed a reminder to do that, then, you know, Yes, do that. <laughs> because it always makes sure we still visit, release the resources. Now, one big thing that people often have on safety critical stuff, it's quite common and embedded in general, really, is that you, know, you avoid dynamic memory allocation. And that's for the three big downsides. You know, there's potentially large worst case times. You, know, you don't know how long your memory allocator will take, and depending on its, and its design, it might have to hunt through to find some space, and that may take a while. Um, and related to that is that not only might it take a while, but the, the timing is unpredictable and, and not consistent. So sometimes it can be quick, and sometimes it can be slow. So you, you give it a test, and you try, and you, know, you might even get as far as you build it on hardware, and you're you know, driving the whole vehicle, and you're testing, and everything's fine. And then one day, you know, you're, somebody else is driving it down the road, and then suddenly it hits the worst case scenario, and now the timing takes too long, and, some, and something misses its time slot, and has consequences. And then, part of, and then fragmentation might mean that things are not necessarily available. When, no, there's enough total memory free, but not one that's big enough, to, not enough bits big enough together for this block that you're trying to allocate, and so it might fail, even though you ha you're not out of RAM in total. And of course, fragmentation often then leads into unpredictable timings and longer worst case. So people often recommend avoiding dynamic memory allocation for these cases. So yeah, so, and likewise, you know, consequently, safety critical standards often say, no, don't use dynamic memory. Um, the MISRA chapter on dynamic memory is far more nuanced than don't use it, but it amounts to, you know, don't use it in lots of cases. <laughs> so, so one option is you can pre-allocate. Um, and that might be pre-allocate uh, at the beginning, uh, at startup. It might be pre-allocate at compile time. Uh, you can 
you could, for example, use optional to allocate some space for an object. The object isn't constructed yet, but it's there. It's got space. Then when you construct the object, it will be safe. It's not going to run out of memory because the space was pre-allocated. Um, on the other hand, you might want to be able to use some, an inline container, like the proposed in-place vector, which we're hoping for, to get for C++26, um, where the space for, the, for all the elements is contained within the container itself, the object itself, rather than heap allocated. So you can create a global object of this type, and boom, you have space for all the things. Or you can create one on the stack in main, and then at startup, there'll be space. And if it doesn't, then your system won't start. And that's very, very easy to pick up. You know, the first time you drive your test vehicle, it's like, well, it doesn't start because there's no memory. OK, fine. Well, we need to change what the settings are or something. Um, and then hopefully, you can get a long way, you know, get, do that before you actually put it on a test vehicle. But you know, if, it's, if it fails at startup, then that's you know, very easy to catch. And, yeah, you can, and you can then stick these in static storage duration objects. Um, so then, well, I have a, I have a vector of you know, a thousand elements, and there will definitely be space for that. And then it is then a logic error if you then try and insert more than a thousand elements into your, into your vector, because somewhere in your analysis you got it wrong. My analysis, your analysis said a thousand should be good, good enough for everybody, um, but actually in practice it turned out it wasn't, and so. Why was that? Would be something that you would then need to look into and you know, work out where that logic error happened. Was it in the design? Was it you know, in the implementation? But it's still it's, it's still a logic error. So yeah, you can allocate in startup. You could allocate on the heap. You could use make unique to allocate a big block containing your inline vector you know, that then you know, has space for exactly the right number of objects, which can grow and fill. But you know that. When you need those objects, they're there. Um, and so now, if you can't use static storage duration or you, you can't put it on the stack because your stack is limited, um, then, you can, then you can use a heap for that. But still, do it at startup. Yeah, or, or stick it on the stack. One of the rules from the Autozar standard is functions shall not call themselves either directly or indirectly. Um, but it looks like we have a yeah. question, so I will stop there from that thought. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Um, I would like to know if you can use custom allocators or so. Um, you, yeah, I mean, you could, you could use um, special allocators if you have it. No, if if you know that you that you have a block of memory, then no. Rather than using inline vector, you could have a special allocator that then use that block of memory. Um, just as well. So yeah, you could use you could use um, polymorphic allocators with a with a with an array of char, um, but you've got to decide where do I get that array of char from, um, and no, so then it's like well you can pre-allocate it, or you can static allocate it. No, there's lots of ways, but yeah. So and you can there's things you can do, but even then you still need to be careful because if you use, if you use um, say std map with an, an allocator that was based, no, a, a stack-based allocator. The thing is, what it allocates is not what you necessarily think that it is. It allocates a, a, um, a node containing the elements and, and things. And if, if you then have, if you then pass that into, it was also, you know, you used a, a PMR string to, to reuse the same stack-based allocator for the string contents. Well, hang on a minute. Now you're mixing things of different sizes in the same memory, and you might still get fragmentation and out-of-memory problems. So you need to be think very carefully about if you use general purpose allocators, even if you're pre-allocated the block. Um, whereas if you use an inline container, then it knows exactly what it's putting in each thing. No, or, or, no, or the simplest case is optional. Well, I am allocating this object, and it goes here, and, it, and it's exactly the right space for it. Um, so. You can use special allocators, and sometimes that works really well, but you need to think carefully about what you're doing if you do so. OK, so yeah, so avoid recursion because, no, well, because the standard says so. And, uh, and on a practical level, there's a reason for that, and, that, and the simple answer is stack overflow. No, if, you, if you have unbounded recursion then you ha and you have limited stack space, then you can, have, no, you can get stack overflow, and that is always bad. No. There's not a lot you can do at a C++ level if the stack overflows. But thankfully, every recursive function can 
be converted to an iterative function um, if you can give it some auxiliary storage. Um, so you can do that, and you should. And if you look at that, doing that, and you say, hang on a minute, this auxiliary storage is too big, well, that would have probably caused you a big problem. No, that's the sort of thing that would lead to, a, a lead, lead to the stack overflow. No. So, and it forces you to consider what these storage requirements are, rather than just saying, oh, yeah, we you know, just call it recursively. No, you just think, well, how deep is that stack going to be? How, how, many, how many levels of recursion would I have? And that now becomes how many levels of iteration have I got, and how much auxiliary storage do I need? And you can think, think through all these things uh, and make it work. So one thing that people often ask about testing is, how do I test my private member functions? And the answer is you don't. You split them out. So if you really, really can't access it through the public interface of this class, then you create a new class of which those are public member functions, or where you can test them through that. And this will then help with your code coverage. It will make your code simpler, um, make the branches easier. And, you know, Maybe it doesn't have to be a publicly usable class. It can be in a detail namespace where you've documented people who are using this do not touch anything in the detail namespace. Now, this is implementation details only. But it means that then you, it is a public nameable thing that you can instantiate in your tests rather than making your tests friends of the class, which some people do, um, especially given that no, friend is not allowed by the MISRA coding standards. So you know, you'd have to create an exception specifically to, to, to say, I really, really need that. And actually, the same applies to, to, to functions as well. If, if you've got complex logic and you can't work out how to test something in the middle, split it apart. Right? Make your bigger function, instead of one great big long function, now it's five smaller ones which are called from the big long one, and you can test each of the five smaller ones independently. Now, it, it makes your life easier in the long run. And when the long run is actually now, because I need to get my coverage stats up in order to you know, things, then it makes your life easier now. Right? So, and often, if you've got a, a function with a switch in, if there's many cases, then it's often easier just to have a, have a separate function for each branch of that switch, um, rather than, rather than um, trying to test everything through the, the, the one long function where all the code is directly there. So yeah, so smaller classes are easier to review, easier to test, and easier for analyzers to check is the other thing, which we're, rely we're relying heavily on our static analyzers uh, smaller functions are easier for them to check and therefore easier for them to pick up problems with it. So, in summary, safety critical software means there's lives at risk. And so we have to follow extensive processes standards and coding standards to make sure that our software is sufficiently you know, reliable and that we can not going to unnecessarily put lives at risk. In order to achieve this, then static analysis is vital because manual checks for compliance are too time consuming and not easily documented. And we want to verify that we've got, that you now provide documentary evidence that we do meet the process and coding standards. Similarly, you will need automated tests because manual tests are not, are time consuming, and again, don't readily provide the evidence to say, we really, really did test this. But you still need code reviews, extensive code reviews, because the analyzers won't check everything. At the very least, you need to verify that your tests are testing what they are supposed to test. Um, I, incidentally, doing test-driven development will help with that, because you start with a failing test. And so if your test doesn't fail before you've even written the code, then you have to think, well, why is that? Does the code really, really do what it's supposed to already? Or um, have I written my test wrong? And so it makes you uh, confront that straight, straight on. And then finally, you must really think about error codes and any error cases and make sure that they get pro properly handled. And, you're, and this must be incorporated into your design. Um, uh, just at the, uh, the, the basic level, you must be thinking through, you know, this code you know, can have safety consequences. What if it goes wrong? 
So, questions? I think we, uh, we still have some time for questions. Mm.